Okay, while we're waiting, do we have any questions? How was your test? It was okay. It was okay. All right. Okay, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes. So no one has any questions about the material that we've covered? Now's the time. I've got a question. Um, okay. Does molyb molybdenum, does it have low or high thermal capacity? Thermal high, meaning that it has the ability. Okay. It does not get hot. So I want to say that's low thermal capacity, right? So it does not get hot. It has the ability to withstand the heat. Okay. okay because yeah. I know that they use it and it, it, it depends on like if it's a high conductor, well, a conductor is going to conduct it and allow it to go through. Then you have one that is an insulator. Well, it's not going to allow anything to go through. So it depends on how the word is being used. If it has a high thermal capacity, means it does, it can withstand a lot of heat. It's just how the sentence is being used that makes it confusing. Yeah, that was, okay. that was throwing me off. Yeah. Okay. That makes mm -hmm. sense though. Yeah. So molybdenum is the majority of the um, anode. If you're thinking about the majority of the element of the anode, the rotating anode, I'll be more specific, the rotating anode. It's like if you think of a high school trap, the track where they run, you know, the back of the high school or wherever it's on the high school. If you think of the grassy area around the track, that's molybdenum. Because we know that we're generating 99% heat. But if you think about the actual track itself, that's tungsten with rhenium. Because that's where you're going to have the electron interactions happen. Okay, and then, and then the graphite is added to it because that has, so that has higher thermal capacity though, right? Right. Okay. It has the ability to withstand more heat. So there's a mixture of um, graphite and um, molybdenum, but mostly molybdenum. And that's going to be, um, and the molybdenum stem, because remember, we're still generating a lot of heat. So where do you want to put molybdenum and where do you want to put graphite? Where do you want to put these elements that are going to withstand a lot of heat where you're generating the heat? Where is the heat being generated? We have a conversion happening. We're going to talk about electricity going into the filament and we're going to see an exchange of energy energy is never created nor destroyed so if we're taking an energy source we are converting that energy along the way so you're responsible for learning what's converting what what is the conversion here because we're never we will never say energy just disappears it will not happen 
energy will be absorbed, but something else will take place with that absorption. So it's always going to continue a path to be converted. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense to you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I'm waiting on one more. Can I ask one more question? Sure, go ahead. As many as you need. Thanks. Um, so when we're talking about the the focusing cup, mm -hmm. um, so I, when it gets when it gets its charge, I was reading that it's okay. So it it gets charged and it has a, it has a, a strong negative charge. Right, it has a strong right. negative charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and it's supposed to do that to keep the electrons in the in the cloud that are released from the filament. Right. Well, it's so actually, my question is. It's, Oh, it's no, going to be, it, okay, so there is a law of repulsion, and I really don't want to get too far into it. So once the negative uh, focusing cup actually gets charged, it is going to aid or boost in the repulsion of electrons, okay? So there's going to be a part, and it, it's in your book, and a little bit more than in detail than what I really need. Um, but we're going to talk about phase one of the exposure and phase two of the exposure. When you have those different phases, different things are being electrified. And when they're being electrified or energized, um, different things are happening. So on phase two, the focusing cup gets charged and it's going to actually push the electrons out, repulse them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was just I was when I was thinking about it because I was thinking like okay, electrons they have a negative charge, and then the focusing cup is negative. So like I get how they would repel each other. I just I didn't understand how it kind of just like it kept them like in the cup. It, it kept them formed and made that. It kept them in the space charge. It kept them right, in the right, space yeah. charge. Uh huh. And then they're gonna in the cloud. It's called the space okay. charge in the the cloud. So it. Yes, there is a law for that, but it's not necessarily, it's encompassing it just because you're having the, the, the nickel that is made up of a negative. But once that nickel becomes truly into play, it's going to be what we're going to call potential difference. And we'll learn that when we get more into physics, but right now we'll touch on potential difference saying negatives are going to rep rep repulse each other and the positive is going to attract each other. And we'll see how that comes into play here in a little bit. But yes and no. I don't want you to go too deep. I don't want to go there yet. But right now, I just need you to see. But you're on the right track. I need you to see where where the steps are with the exposure, phase one and phase two. Any other questions? All right. Okay. So I think we're all here. Perfect. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so we were just getting started with the cathode. We were just getting started with the cathode. Yeah, I want to see everybody. Perfect. Okay, so when we think about the cathode, we're just basically venturing off to the other side. We are venturing off to the other side. We are just saying, hey, this is the other side. We know that we're going to talk about these components. We know where the stator is. We know where the rotor is. We know what the anode disc is, the anode stem. The anode stem is made up of what? Anyone? What is the anode stem made of? Molybdenum. Molybdenum, thank you. And there is a purpose for that. We also touched a little bit for the cathode material. 
that we have two parts. We have two major parts of the cathode. We have two major parts of the cathode. In our recipe for creating x-rays, we have to have the source of free electron. We have to have electrons. Now, what do we know about electrons? From your AMP class that you took in before being admitted into this program, what did they learn or what did they say about electrons? Negatively charged. They have a negative charge. And what are they attracted to? Positive. Positive. Where are the positives located? In the anode. In Rack or where do the electrons okay so let's let's go back to this let's go back and think about electrons where do electrons reside if i wanted to find an electron where would i go and look for it Sorry. I'm sure about that. the outer rings of the, the outer atom. rings of an atom nothing tricky electrons orbit the nucleus, right? Inside of the nucleus, we have what? Protons. protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons. So electrons are orbiting outside of the atom's nucleus, where the protons and the neutrons reside. Electrons are naturally attracted to the protons. And in most stable atoms, you will have as many electrons as you do protons. Make sense? Yes? So this is something that we have as, okay, we, we took college courses. I know this. I know this. Okay, so we're going to kind of touch place, touch base on this section. When we're talking about free electrons, it's kind of hard to figure out where we can find free electrons. What do we know about electrons? They're negative. They have a negative charge. And they want to be bound to a positively charged atom. So if these electrons are free, they are in search of. What are they in search of? Amy, what are electrons searching for? Sorry, um, for a, to make a pair? I don't know. make a pair. Absolutely. It's almost like an electron is a lonely bachelor looking for a proton female or whatever it is, right? So when you're thinking about it, an electron is looking to bind itself to a positive charged atom. Okay. With that being said, this is going to be the force John in that we're kind of talking about okay but before we get in there let's look at what the elements are for the cathode so we know that the cathode is going to provide that free source of electrons we know that we need electrons to bombard over to our anode target so that we can create x-rays perfect we also have as part of a a, a, a part of the cathode is going to be the filament and the focusing cup. The filament, the filament is our actual source. This is the actual source of our electrons. The filament is where we're going to get our electrons. It's kind of like the supermarket. I want electrons, I got to go to the filament. Okay? My filament is my electron source. The filament is the electron source, we, and the focusing cup is where it houses the filament. The focusing cup houses the filament. The filament sits in the focusing cup. Okay? Any questions there? The filament is our source for electrons. The focusing cup houses the filament. They are made of two different types of material. The filament is made primarily, again, of tungsten. We've seen this element before. Why do we like tungsten? 
Miss Betty, why do we like tungsten? It's a high resistant to um, heat. It has a high melting point, yes, a high resistance to heat. So it's not going to break off in high heat temperatures. Perfect. I love it. But here we also have a bit of thorium. Where on the anode side, we saw tungsten mixed with rhenium. On the filament or cathode side, we have tungsten mixed with thorium to keep from the filament breaking off. Okay? So anode side, we have tungsten with a splash of rhenium. On the cathode side, we have tungsten with a splash of thorium. Together, these two elements make up the filament. That is the material of the filament. The focus uh, is, yes. I have a question, I'm sorry. What did you say about tungsten and thorium is to keep from? The thorium is added to the tungsten to keep the filament from breaking apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the focusing cup is made out of nickel. Nickel. The focusing cup is made out of nickel. And we also talked about what is a dual focus tube. We have two sizes. Can someone refresh my memory? What is the purpose of having two separate sizes of filaments? To provide a large or small focal spot? Good. That's eventually. Now, what, what focal spot are we talking about there, John? Uh, this, I guess, would be the actual focal spot. It would be the actual focal spot. However, you are correct. In the book, it says, oh, the large one's going to provide an, a larger focal spot. The smaller one is going to provide a smaller focal spot. But the real truth is the larger one is going to provide a larger amount of electrons. The smaller one is going to provide a smaller amount of electrons. Now, when I have a digit versus a chest, I need a different amount of electrons. Eventually, I need a larger amount of photons or x-rays to cover the dimensions of a 14 by 17 field. When I have an 8 by 10 field, I don't need a, la a large source of electrons because electrons will eventually make my x-rays. I'll say that again. Electrons will determine how many x-rays are made. The number of electrons will determine how many x-rays are made. The number of electrons will determine how many x-rays are made. So if I use the large filament, I will have a larger supply of electrons will eventually get converted into a larger amount of x-rays. If I use the small filament, same thing, but less. I will generate a small amount of electrons that will convert into a smaller amount of x-rays. Make sense? Yes? Good, perfect. Now, which one is better, the small or the large for image quality? The small? The small one. So ideally, we would love to use the small one because we're always chasing image quality. However, if I keep using my small one all the time, no matter how much thorium and tungsten I have, I'm going to um, eventually burn out my filament. Make sense? Yes? Any questions? Okay, perfect. So, the dual focus tubes or the dual focusing cups, it, it will have a large and a small. This right here is a picture of a filament. This right here is a picture of the small filament. This entire 
section or circle is the focusing cup. It is the focusing cup and it's made out of nickel. Only one filament can be activated for exposure. Only one filament can be activated for exposure. You can only you can only choose one at a time. Make sense? Okay, so they both do not operate at the same time. Only one can be chosen for each exposure. The filaments sit parallel to each other. The filaments sit parallel to each other, meaning they will never intersect. Okay, any questions? On this slide before I move forward. Pretty easy to understand? Go ahead. Uh, I have a question about... Uh... So we say, uh, you know, cathode repel each other, and but right now we say the cathode att attracts like opposite charge, like positive. So when the cathode attracts attract uh, repel each other, like attracting negative charge. Okay, so we're gonna energize the cathode. The whole cathode is a negative charge. The whole cathode is a negative charge. Oh. Now, Asias, remember, what's the recipe for x-rays? Because you're going to have in your book that tells you there are three things yes. that you need to know how to make x-rays. But what is Miss Lara's version of x-ray recipe? Like, we need to have source. Okay, so we know that the source is going to be the filament. Okay, what's the and next thing? We need to have, like, flow of electron. Flow of electrons. So we need to get those electrons into kinetic energy. They need to move. Right? Yes. And then what's the third thing? Uh, we need to do like bombard, stop the electron. Abruptly stop them. And that's going to be over in the anode target, correct? Yes. So when we're talking about being a negative charge of the cathode, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more. You know what? I think it's on my next one. Here we go. When we activate, when we energize, when we apply electricity to the focusing cup, it is going to create a negative charge. But electricity is only applied in certain times. Okay? So let me read this slide, and we're going to figure out what is happening on the cathode side. So the focusing cup is going to be negatively charged. Once it is electrified, once electricity current is passing through it, it is going to create a negative charge. It's made of nickel. It surrounds the filament. Not in the front. It doesn't completely house it. The front of the filament is open. The purpose of it being open is that when the filament starts to receive a charge, I'm sorry, when the focusing cup starts to receive that negative charge, that forces the electrons together into a cloud. So, and this is going a little bit backwards, but I want you to see this is negatively charged. It's going to force the charge on all sides. It's going to force these electrons to stay together in the cloud. Okay. But then once it gets turned off, we're going to allow the anode side to do its force attraction. Okay, so let me get into a little bit more of what's happening here. I think it goes into the next one and I'll explain it. So the focusing cup becomes negatively charged. It's going to force these electrons that are going to be boiled off, and I'll explain that, into a cloud in front of the filament. There's going to be a line of electrons in front of this filament sitting inside of the focusing cup. This is a law. I know that we talked about the law of repulsion, but this is going to be where the, the uh, electrons stay until there is another charge activated. Okay? When the electrons stay in this cloud, 
when the electrons stay in this cloud, a cloud of electrons, after they've been boiled off by the filament. This cloud is going to be indicative. This is going to be called the space charge. Okay? So, let me back up. Okay? We're putting it all together. What is happening under thermionic emission? Thermionic emission. Thermionic emission is a process where electricity is being supplied to the filament. The filament is getting extremely, extremely hot. Oops. Extremely hot. So electricity is coming in to the filament, right? We know that there is a focusing cup. They're just showing you this depiction so that you can see the filament getting hot. Thermionic emission is where the filament gets so hot that electrons of the tungsten atom, tungsten electrons, are boiled off. The filament gets so hot, because remember the filament is made up of tungsten with 2% of thorium at most. Tungsten electrons are getting boiled off this is the process of thermionic emission. This is why the filament is your source for now free electrons. Thermionic emission is the process where electricity has been applied into creating heat and heat has now boiled off these electrons. So now we have a free or a source of electrons, and they still hold a negative charge. They still hold a negative charge. The focusing cup gets activated or electrified as energy, and it holds these electrons together, okay? The space charge or the cloud in front of the filament is activated by the focusing cup. It is charged negatively and it is holding, the force is holding these electrons together. This is all I really need you to know right now. We're gonna talk about forces, just not right now, okay? Does everyone understand what thermionic emission is? Does everyone understand what's the purpose of the filament? Does everyone understand what's the purpose of the focusing cup? The focusing cup is to hold these electrons from flying away from each other by applying a force. Now, this is a slide that I found. We don't have this, so make sure that you get the information. The space charge which is the cloud of electrons outside of the filament that has been boiled off. Electrons emitted from the tungsten filament, because that's what it's primarily made of, form a small cloud in front of the filament. This collection of negatively charged electrons forms the space charge. Now, this is not something that we can continue to pack so many electrons. If you over activate your filament and over boil off electrons, what can happen is the space charge effect. The space charge effect. The space charge effect happens when the tendency of space charge to limit the emission of other electrons from the filament. When the cloud has reached capacity with electrons, you cannot boil off any more. The space charge effect happens and your system shuts down. Space charge is when the electrons that are emitted hang. They are, they are forced to stay together by the focusing cup. If there's too many electrons that are being boiled off, meaning you just have your hand on that little button and you're just waiting 
It's too much, too much for your console to happen. Space charge effect happens and it shuts down your um, x-ray machine. The electrons will go back. Mm -mm. I don't see Wani. I don't see her waiting in my... I don't see anyone in my lobby. Okay, yeah, it's because she's telling me that um, she, I sent her the link again, and it's to, and it's just showing her like a blank, a blank page. It doesn't give her the option to join the meeting. I don't know if it's because we're already started, or oh, uh, you know what? That's probably it. To be honest with you, I think after a certain amount of time, it won't. I won't allow. Um, I'd have to I have to go back into the meeting settings and see if we see if I can order in. Yeah, hey, I no. I told her to try to see if she can log in from her phone. but I don't, I don't think it's going to make a difference, honestly. It's because I have it locked out to after so much time. It's just easy unlock them. There you go. Try color. Try now. Arisella, did you have something? Yeah. yeah. You need to go. Okay. Does everybody understand what space charge is? So that's a new language, right? You know what space charge is? What is space charge, Daniel? In your own words. It's a cloud of electrons. Where do these where do these electrons come from? From the filament. Okay, what process is happening, Luke, from the filament to create this space cloud? It's heating up and it's boiling off the electrons. What is that called? Uh, the uh, what's it called again? The thermo thermo thermonic emissions. Thermionic emissions. So if yes. I say thermionic emissions from now on, from now on for the rest of the two years, y'all will know what I'm talking about when I say thermionic emission. And when thermionic emission, where do I find that at, Julie? What part of the tube is that happening in? Cathode. The cathode. I love it. What sizes of filaments are there, Marisela? Uh, small and large. Small and large, perfect. Okay, and thank you, Amy, veteran. Um, let's see, and what are they made up of? Um, Stephanie, what is the filament made up of? It's made of tungsten with a splash of thorium. I love splash, good, I love it. All right, perfect. Tracy, what's the focusing cup made of? Nickel. Nickel. Perfect. Love it. Son, so electricity is coming into the filament. What's happening to the filament again? It's being blown off through thermotic emission. Unmute for me, son. Yeah. yeah, what's happening? What's happening to the filament again when the electricity is energizing the filament? You unmute it for me again. Uh, there you go. The filament released the electron? It does, under a ex extreme, extreme amounts of heat, right? It has to get super, super hot in order for these electrons to boil off. Perfect. 
I think we have it, guys. So here's what happens. I got a star. I love stars. I love stars. Stars. Star. In my version, to make x-rays, we needed a free source. We needed electrons. We needed electrons to move. And we needed to collide those electrons. Two things are going to be converted from this what is going to be known as kinetic energy kinetic energy is can energy in motion we have these electrons and they're sitting in a cloud we need to get those that cloud of electrons moving what do we call when electricity moves or electrons move what do we call that the current we will call it electrical current when electrons move it is electrical current it is current 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 is electricity or electrons in motion okay so the three things needed to produce x-rays are now present we need to have filament electrons we're going to talk about the words potential difference Potential difference. There is a scientific version in your book. I'm going to give you the short summary version of what is potential difference. Okay. We also need a vehicle on which kinetic energy can ride. So we now need a vehicle that's going to allow these electrons to move over to flow. And then we need a place for interaction, which is going to be our target. So here we have these electrons from the filament sitting in a space cloud. We now need to attract. We need to attract. We need to attract these electrons over. Once we apply attraction, the electrons will now convert the energy from what was once thermal now into kinetic. They are now moving. And now we need a place for interaction. So this is pretty fancy. This is all okay, Ms. Laura, large potential difference to give kinetic energy to the filament electrons. You said provided by KVP. We're going to get to that. We are. A vehicle on which the kinetic energy can ride and a place for interaction. Perfect. So let's talk about that. Here we know that we have the focusing cup. Focusing cup is made out of nickel. Nickel. Filament is made out of tungsten with a flash of thorium. Flash of thorium, love it, good. So here we have the whole process of the three steps. So now we have a cloud of electrons. Does everyone see my cloud of electrons? They are sitting inside of the focusing cup because the focusing cup has now been energized to keep this space cloud together. But something is going to happen because these cl this cloud is stationary. It's not moving. I cannot make x-rays unless I can get these electrons to move. Well, what charge, Sharon, does the anode have? Positive. So when you think about it, will a positive attract a negative? Yes. Yes. Absolutely, with an exclamation point, yes. Got it? A positive will attract these negatives. It's kind of like this for me. Uh, there we go. I'll go back to everything else I skipped over. Doesn't that look delicious? Let me tell you, if that is appealing to you, you are going to migrate towards that. Does that make sense? So anything that you are attracted to, if cake is your thing, like it is my thing, chocolate cake on top of that, I'm gonna walk on over, grab me a slice, right? 
especially if you have the rest of the class trying to get in front of you, I'm going to move faster. Make sense? So when you think of something that is attractive and you can't stop it, you are going to now generate kinetic energy. It is energy now in motion to where? To what you're attracted to. In layman's terms, does every under, everyone understand what I am saying? So when we go back, what is an electron attracted to? Protons. What? Positive charge, a proton. A positive charge. So now you have, it's kind of like, you know, those little bugs that are attracted to light and they just swarm the light because they're attracted to it. Well, now guess what? We have these electrons. We are going to apply energy to make this anode extremely attractive. The more attractive this anode, guess what happens to the electrons energy kinetic energy okay. Naomi if I apply if I made this anode highly attractive positively right because it's a positive it's going to be attractive if I increase the attractiveness what do you think is going to happen to these electrons do you think they're going to come over faster or slower faster absolutely faster so when the anode gets charged or electrified or energy is applied to it however you want to say it this focusing cup is going to stop being energized and the potential difference between negative and positive is going to become stronger the stronger the attraction or the positivity, the faster these electrons will flow. When the electrons flow over, this is called tube current. Tube current. Tube current. So important. Tube current. It is the flow of electrons going over to the anode because the anode has been energized to be so attractive. So let's talk about the energy. Electricity supplied to the filament. The energy was converted into heat. Heat created a, or the, the heating of the filament caused thermionic emission. The emission of electrons from its tungsten atoms. The energizing of the focusing cup has allowed the electrons to stay in one place. They haven't floated over. Now, once we release the energy here, we stop the energy of the focusing cup simultaneously, we energize that positive anode, creating that attraction. Or, this word, potential difference. The attraction of the anode will attract these electrons to move into kinetic energy or tube current where they can collide with the, um, where are we? With the um, anode, there we go. Okay, so does everyone see this is the collision now mm, Ruth what part of the anode is the electrons colliding with mm. the effective focal spot or the actual focal spot the actual focus good so if I said then what is the this is this electrons or is this x-ray it's x-ray it is x-ray the electrons will flow over bombard the energy 
that they possess in motion, right? Now, think about it. If you're running real fast and you hit a brick wall, what's going to happen to you? You're going to bounce off, right? Energy is going to be leaving, kinetic energy is going to be leaving your body because you've been abruptly stopped. That energy is now in the form of what we call a photon or a bundle of energy. Right? Amazing. So the energy that was once kinetic with these electrons flowing over will be either converted into heat or it'll be converted into x-rays. So what focal spot is this, Pamela? What focal spot is this? If this one is actual, then this one is? Be the effective focal spot? It is the effective. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Effective focal spot. Good, good, good. Ms. Laura, um, can you repeat what you said about tube current? You said it was the flow of electrons going over yeah. to the anode? Yeah. yeah, from the cathode over to the anode. Okay, thank you. That tube current is the electrons flowing from the cathode to the anode. Now, again, here's our free electrons. Recipe number one. We need these electrons to move. How do we get them to move, Wani? How do we get those electrons to get kinetic energy? Movement. How do they move? What makes them move? Who's got it? With energy. Okay, with energy, but what energy? John, help me out. Kinetic help energy. Out. Yeah, how do we get kinetic energy activated? Heat. No, I think we're throwing no. words out there. Mm, John, help me out. How do we get this electron? Thermionic emission? Thermionic emission is how we got the electrons in the first place. Oh, okay. Thermionic emission does not make electrons move. Uh, the John, anode is the anode. The anode is the anode is charged positively. So it's kind of like this. If I want some of this cake, I gotta run to it, don't I? If not, it's gonna be gone. If it was uh, something I wasn't attracted to, chances are I probably wouldn't move that fast. Make sense? So when we think about it, in a nutshell, what makes our free electron source? The filament. Under what type of process? Thermionic emission. The focusing cup is energized to keep the space cloud. What makes tube current happen? We have now energized the anode. It has a positive charge. We have a whole bunch of electrons which have a negative charge and they are truly attracted to the positive charge. We flow these over, they collide with the anode target at the actual focal spot. Two conversions happen from this kinetic energy, either in the form of heat energy or x-ray energy. I will stop there and answer your questions. Got a lot going on, don't we? Sarah, so the um when it hits the actual spot, it'll make the X ray and then when it hits um the other it will be just heat. No, no, no. Actually all of the electrons that come over are either gonna form it all the electrons, let's just say hundred percent of the electrons that flow over. Ninety nine percent will be your energy when they collide or interact with the focal track will generate heat. The other 1% will emerge as x-rays. There has to be a sufficient amount of energy that has to be completed in order for x-rays to emit. And we'll talk about the types of interactions in the next chapter. So again, if you have 100 electrons that will boil off, 
100 electrons that were boiled off, 99 of them, once they hit collision, will be converted into heat. One will emerge as an X-ray. That's why we just don't boil off 100 electrons. Okay. Did they answer your question? Thank you. Uh huh. Ms. Laura, so the so the voltage or the KVP, that's just that all it is. That's the potential difference, right? That's how it's. That's the potential difference. So we have ten thousands. We have kilo. We were talking about ten to uh, we're uh, up to a hundred and. 50 kVp. So you're talking about 150,000 kilo voltage that's being applied to this anode that creates more attraction. So when you go back and think about it, the voltage that is being applied, which is just still electricity, okay, is going to generate this high attractiveness or positivity of the anode. Eventually, kVp, which charges our anode, will determine how fast we get electrons to flow or to current, okay? The potential difference, you're right, I think I went over, John. So the KVP or the anode attractiveness is what creates that potential difference. Does, when, um, when you create the potential difference or when you have voltage, does that, does that de does that decrease current? Does like current get trans transformed into voltage? No. No. Okay. No. Because the, the on the what if, what we're gonna learn here, tube current is going to be uh, measured in amperes, which is still electron flow. So no, the KVP is going to determine the speed of your current. However, the unit of measure is still going to be actually milliampere. But I do want you to understand tube current is not the quantity of how many electrons are in it. Tube current is how fast the current is flowing. When you think about a river, you're not thinking about all the water particles that are in the river. You're not, you're not quantifying that. You're quantifying the speed of the river. So when you're thinking about current, current is the speed of flow. If I want to generate a slower flow, then I would lower my operational factor, which would be KVP, because the voltage is what's making um, this more attractive or less attractive. So if there is a higher attraction, the flow of the electrons will be faster. If there is a lower attraction, the flow of the, the, the current will be slower. Any questions? Oh yeah. my God, this is the time. This is the time because we're going to be finishing it up on Wednesday. So the tube current and the potential difference, they're different. They're not the same. Or I thought they were the same for some reason. No, no. Potential difference is what is. What's your favorite thing, is Betty? What's your favorite thing to eat? I'm going to use food because it's getting close to lunchtime. What is your favorite thing to eat? Cheesecake. Cheese. Oh, thank you. The strawberry. Okay, so. There's one slice of cheesecake left sitting on the table. Luke is eyeing it with you. Luke is looking at it and he's like, I'm about to take it as baby. What's going to ensure that you have that piece of cake more better, uh, more than he would? What would determine that? My current, I'm going to be running. So if you're running, that's how fast you are moving. The, now I'm going to take the cheesecake and put, I don't know, broccoli. I don't know if you like broccoli or not. What's your current going to be different from the, from the broccoli to the cheesecake? I'm going to walk and let him take it. Okay. So the attraction was different. Make sense? So because you were attracted to the cheesecake... The cheesecake made you walk faster because it was more appealing to you. Potential difference is how much attraction, what is the strength 
what is the force of that attraction? Meaning if I, does that make sense to you? I don't want to go further into other types of foods, but do you understand what I'm saying? If you, you like cheesecake so much, you are strongly attracted to it. Somebody else may not like cheesecake. So their attraction is different. So the potential difference between the electron and the, and the positive charged anode is how strong is the anode energized? Make sense? Thank you. Yeah. I hope that for right now, that's what you need to know. What energizes the anode voltage is what we're going to learn in the next chapter. Okay, but that's taking us a little bit further. This chapter starts into bringing a lot from the previous chapters, the words, and I'm trying to take a lot of them out because I'm not there yet. I don't want you to get caught up in the previous chapter words. If I'm not introducing them, don't worry about them just yet. Got it? The potential difference here is how, how attractive, how positive is this going to be? How much energy are we emphasizing this um, positive anode. The higher it is, the faster the current. The lower it is, the slower the current. It all has to do with what your attraction is, that force. Does that make sense? Is that getting better? No, yes? Miss Laura, when does that anode become positive? That's what we're going to talk about here in a minute. Okay, because I'm thinking, like, how would the cloud even form if the anode is always positive? Oh. Here we go. Getting Here's there. The principles of operation. So, at the operating console, the radiographer is going to select three things, just three for right now. We're going to talk about KVP, we're going to talk about MA, and we're going to talk about time. I don't want you to know what all of these are just yet. I don't. This is a whole semester of information that is not on this test on Friday. Got it? Yes. You understand? Please don't make me put this all on the test on Friday. Okay? All right. So let's talk about it. When the exposure switch, when you press that exposure switch, some of the electricity from the wall is diverted to the induction motor. What is that, Naomi? What is the induction motor and where can I find it? The induction motor. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I'm trying to follow you. So we get this, we have these large heavy cables, right, coming from the wall and the filament mm -hmm. is the electrons. It's all right, got. okay, that's all right. So the induction motor is found where? On the anode side. Amy, right? What is the induction motor? Come on, Amy. Um, well, I know it's in the anode side and it has the rotor and the wait, stator. Stator, yes. The rotor and the stator, right? So we know that when we press that button on the x-ray tube, I mean, on the x-ray console, some of the electricity is now operating the induction motor. What's the purpose of the induction motor? Aurora, what does the induction motor do? I'm sorry, Ms. Lara. I'm still trying to understand it. Um, does it... I don't know, I guess... This you know what, so maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll explain it in my own words, okay? All right, so thank you. So when the exposure switch is first pressed, there's two phases. We're on the first phase, okay? When you press the exposure switch, there are two phases. We're on the first phase. Some of the electricity is diverted to the induction motor. What is the purpose of the induction motor? The induction motor is getting the rotor to turn. If it turns the rotor, then our anode disc is also turning. So the purpose of the induction motor is to turn our anode disc. So as that is happening in phase number one, 
the induction motor is going to turn once it gets to about 3,400 RPMs. We are not releasing x-rays yet. We have just used the electricity to get the induction motor operating. Got it? Yes? So the anode disc is spinning. Now, this only lasts a couple of seconds. At the same time that the induction motor is happening, the selected filament is now energized. So we're still on phase number one. The selected filament is energized and, energized and we undergo thermionic emission. So phase number one of the switch, the induction motor is operating, the anode is spinning up to 3,400 RPMs, and thermionic emission is happening. Got it? Yes? Perfect. The second phase the, happens. Go ahead. Can you, re can you repeat the, the steps for the first phase? Okay. So, right here. On the first phase, some of the electricity is, uh, is energizing on the anode side, and we are energizing the induction motor to spin the anode disc up to about 3,400 RPMs. On the cathode side, same phase, we are now doing thermionic emission. So induction motor is activated in phase one as well as thermionic emission is happening in phase one. While thermionic emission is happening also in phase one, the nickel is going to be Charge. So the current, the current heat, the filament to the point of electrons being boiled off. The focusing cup forms them into a cloud. Once the, the space charge reaches capacity, we know that that's the space charge effect. This is all happening simultaneously. We talked about kinetic energy. Uh, does it continue? No, I took out the part where it talks about the anode. I think we were still here. So once this becomes charged, this is going to be charged on the second phase. The anode is going to be charged on the second phase, and that is what's going to drive the electrons over into collision. So first phase, the induction motor is going to spin the anode disc. It is also going to create thermionic emission. Second phase, the focusing cup is going to repel, give this a little push out as well as attract on the anode side. And this is what is going to get what was not moving into movement. Phase one, anode side, induction motor, thermionic emission. And phase two, we actually start to current and the collision to happen or interactions is what we're gonna learn about them later. So before we finish out the principles, I want you to understand what is kinetic energy. When we're thinking about electricity or we're thinking about current, current is gonna flow one way. When we're talking about the, the, the X-ray tube, we know that the cathode is going to have, ele electrons are gonna flow from the cathode over to the anode. It goes in one way. Negativity or electrons are going to be attracted to positive. This is the whole point of this. Negative is going to be attracted to positive. To get the negative to reach positivity, there has to be flow or current that is called two current. The electrons are flowing over from the cathode to the anode. How do we get them to flow to the anode? Two, two ways. We repulse them as well as re attract them. And this is going to be considered that potential difference.
So we're going to finish out with principles of operations because it basically gets into the process of what we're talking about here. If I were to say, explain this image to me, explain it. We've already covered the cathode, right? The negative side, the anode, the positive side. What over on the cathode side contributes to making the x-ray? Anyone? What on the cathode side will contribute to the overall generating of an x-ray? Electrons. Go ahead, Esbedi. Go ahead. I was going to say the electrons. Okay, so we know that the electrons that have to flow over to collide with the anode come from the cathode side. Where do they come from and what process? Tracy. The filament. They're boiled off, right? Where do they come from and on what process? The electrons, Tracy. The electrons come from the cathode. No, more specifically. Where do they boil off from? The filament. Thank you. And what is that process called? Thermionic emission. Good. So now we have electrons that are sitting in a cloud, John. They're just sitting there. If too many electrons occupy that cloud, John, what is that called? The space cloud effect. The space charge effect. Good. Perfect. I love it. All right. John N. How do I get these electrons to move over to the anode? Because that's where the interactions or x-rays are going to be formed. You attract them while repelling them or repulsing them. Uh, you create a potential difference. So how do I do that? By uh, uh, applying KVP. Okay. Applying, but now we're jumping ahead. Okay. But in layman's term, if you're talking to me and I'm a kindergartner, how do I get those electrons to move? Um, you create a positive charge on the anode side? You create a positive charge on the anode side. How do I get that positive charge to be even more positive? Let me go ahead and go to Amy. Um, is it by repelling them? Mm, a positive charge is going to attract. those. That anode is like an open arms by to those electrons. It's wanting them. Increasing how desirable. John the and said we're applying KVP, but in layman's terms, we're applying electricity. We're applying electricity to the anode. Is it just like we're applying electricity to make thermionic emission happen? Just like we're applying electricity to make thermionic emission happen, we're applying electricity to make the anode positive. Got it? Just like we applied electricity to heat up this filament and create thermionic emission, we applied electricity to make this anode more of a positive charge, creating that potential difference. If a positive is going to attract a negative, will that change the rate of the current, Duan? If the positive becomes more positive, will that change the speed of how the electrons flow over? Yes. Yes, and what do we call that flowing of electrons? Potential difference. Potential difference is when a positive attracts a negative. Uh, what do we call the flow of electrons? Two current. Thank you. Tube current. Daniel, so we have this tube current going into the anode, and we're expecting a collision. Two things are going to be converted from that kinetic energy. What two things will be converted from the kinetic energy? X-rays and heat. 99% heat, 1% x-rays or photons. You got it. Two things, 99 and 1%. Oh, the, uh, was it the heat? Yes. 99% uh, the heat and... Uh, 1% What's 1%? Photons. X-rays. X Thank you. 
Good. I don't want to have to say it 99 and 1% for you guys to remember that. Got it? Two things happen. Kinetic energy is flowing. Energy and motion is going to be converted once this electron abruptly collides with the anode or at the actual focal spot. Two things will emerge. Two forms of energy. Heat and x-ray. Perfect. Awesome. What is this? Focal spot called right here. Mm, who am I not? Esaias. The actual focal spot. What kind of focal spot is this called? Is that the effective? You are correct. I love it. You see how when you put things together, when you start to put things together, it makes sense. Don't get stuck on the words. Learn what the words are talking about. I know that it's very technical. A lot of it is very technical. I need you to know eventually what, how do you label this? Go back. And can you now label all of that? Can you? Can you label all of that? I say about 95%. It's better you're smiling, so I'm assuming that's a yes. That's better? I th yeah, I think so. I mean, I have to go over it, but yes, yeah, like I, I, I... But you can not only tell me, you can... I'm sure that you guys are going to be able to label this, but you will also be able to tell me how x-rays are made. There's a lot more to it. We're just scratching the surface. Just scratching the surface. Cathode, oh, that's when we get our free electrons. Anode, oh, that's where we get our potential difference or the attraction of the anode to cause tube current. Oh, at the focal target or the target, that's where we actually have the electrons collide with the target and two types of energies emerge. Heat, which we need to dissipate. Julisha, how do we dissipate heat? Because that's problematic. Um, the oil bath and cooling fans. Good. And what do we need to do with the x-rays? Um, Javier, now where do we need to do with the x-rays? You had it. I just saw it unmuted. Javier. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, what do we need to do with those x-rays now? If you look at this image right here, where do we need to send those x-rays out of? What is that word called? What is that? Can you see that word up here? Is it the filament in the focus? No. Nope. No, the what port. What does this word say right there? Port. This is going to be considered the area See where we have, see where the filament is? If we know the filament is right here, electrons are going to be flowing from here to here, correct? Yeah. So if we know that the electrons are flowing from here to here, this port is for what? It's an exit of, what is exiting out of the port? Justly. Uh, yep, I called your name. What are we? What's exiting out of the port? X-rays. This is where we aim our tube. This is exactly where we aim our tube. Because we know where the X-rays are going to come out of our X-ray tube. I have a question. Actually. Sure. Um, would that be part of the effective focus part, right? Well, the effective focal spot is the section of the angling. So remember the line focus principle. We angle this, so this is going to be the actual. The effective focal spot is not a, um, oh, how could I say it? The effective focal spot will be right here, right under the anode. And then once it gets past the port, it is called the primary beam. Okay? If that will make any sense to you. Yeah, it does. Okay? Thank you. So the effective focal spot is going to be here, but once it gets out of the port, 
it'll be the x-ray primary beam. Bisla, is the sure. effective and the focal spot the same thing? Of what? Of, uh, like, where we... I know that um, once the... Yeah, the effective focal spot is inside of the x-ray tube. The effective focal spot does not leave the x-ray tube. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it did. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the effective focal spot does not leave the x-ray tube. So if I were to look at all of this and I had to go back and play them, we know that the stators stay outside. We know that the rotor is on the inside of the envelope, whether it's metal or glass. We know that the anode stem connects the rotor to the anode disc. We know what the anode stem is made of. We know what the rotor is made of. We know what the stator is made of. We know how the stator and the rotor interact with each other. The magnets inside of the stator move the iron rotor, right? This moving of the iron rotor also rotates the anode. To how fast, Wani? How fast can the, the, the anode spin? Is 3,000 for him? Yep, and a general tube. So we also know that the anode has a face. On that face, there is a focal track. The focal track is where what happens, Sharon? You mean what's the name of the focal spot? Okay, so as this focal track is spinning, remember, this is happening in phase one. As soon as we hit that exposure switch, this is spinning. So we know also when it's spinning in phase two, the electrons are released and attracted. We know that they're going to hit here at the actual focal spot. So anywhere along that track, right? can be the focal spot or the actual focal spot. What is the focal track made of? Re, re, tungsten. Tungsten. That's always a good choice because both the filament and the focal track are made of tungsten. Well, what is the secondary element? Uh, re, renium. Renium. Beautiful. Woohoo! All right, so on the other side, electricity is coming in to the cathode. This is being energized, where electricity is now supplying to the filament. What is happening, Maricela, at the filament? The electrons are being released by thermionic emission. Absolutely, that filament is boiling off those electrons. What's containing them, Luke? In a space cloud. Like the the electron cloud thing that's there, just the Yeah, how how is that being where, what's containing them? What is housing them? What is keeping them in a cloud? I uh it's made of nickel. I can't remember its name. Focusing cup. Like yes, oh. beautiful. The focusing cup is keeping them focused and not letting them release. Well, Shivu, what happens when they're when we're ready to release those electrons? What do I need to do to the anode? Yes, it's spinning. Yes, the mechanicals are spinning, but what do I need now to apply to this anode to create kinetic energy of the electrons? It's being energized. It has to be energized. It has to be energized, and we're gonna later say that's KVP. Right now, I don't care. Not for this test. Got it? Good. What do we call that, son, when electrons are now moving? What do we call that? Two carat. Tube. Finish that word. Tube. I can't hear you. Tube. You're on mute, son. Tube, help them out, Pamela. Current. Current. It is 
called tube current. Beautiful. And the two types of energies, Ruth, that emerge after those electrons hit the focal track or the focal spot is what? Ruth? Yes, Ruth. Um, that would be uh, the... The two energies that emerge from the two current kinetic energy. What is that called? The radical condition. You have heat and you have photons. Heat and x rays. Heat and x rays. Got it? Perfect. What's a vacuum tube? Stephanie, when I say that, what does a vacuum tube mean? And why is that important here now that we've learned what is happening inside of the x-ray tube? Um, I know the vacuum tube. What's inside of the vacuum tube? Is there the presence of air? Yes, so it's good. No air. When it moves the electrons so it doesn't collide, right? With right. the other electrons. Good job, thank you. If we have the presence of air in here, my electrons would be bombarding with air. We would not be converting x-rays. So there is no air molecules present inside of the envelope. And that is the reason that this x-ray tube needs to remain vacuum, empty of air, void of air. No oxygen, no hydrogen, none of it. Make sense? Because we do not want our electrons going off anywhere else other than to the actual focal spot. So, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We have talked about everything that I need you to know for the x-ray tube. Everything. I need you to go through the operation portions of it. We'll touch on quality when we see each other on Wednesday. If you are not understanding anything that is coming out of my mouth, then you, my friends, need to set up a tutoring session. Make sense? I am available for tutoring. But for the most part, we have completed the chapter. Except for the quality portion of it. Be prepared to label an x-ray tube. Be prepared to tell me the materials of the construct of the x-ray tube. And then please be prepared to tell me what is happening when phase one and phase two of the energized states. I'll say that again. Be prepared to label the x-ray tube and housing. Be prepared to tell me what the materials or elements construct the different parts of the x-ray tube and be able to tell me the operation, what's happening in phase one and phase two of the exposure. Questions? Uh, I have two. Sure. Um, so for the focal track, it's made of tungsten and molybdenum, right? That's the no, okay, so, okay, do, okay. Javier, do you remember your track at your high school? Do you remember your track at your high school, Javier? I can see you say yes. Do you remember yeah. your track, your track at the high school? Yes. Remember the, the part that you walk on? That was a different material than everything else. You could tell you were on the track because the track was made of different material, right? So your track was probably surrounded by grass. Yes? Is that fair enough to say? So the track that you walked on or you ran was made of a specific material. On the anode disc, if you were to look at the flat part of the anode,
right here. This is kind of like your track at high school. So this part right here was made of is made of tungsten. This is the part where you would walk at, right? Where you would actually have the interactions. This is made of tungsten and rhenium. The grassy part or around your track, inside and outside, is made of, of molybdenum with a mixture of graphite. A little bit. So the actual focal track where were the electrons, tungsten electrons from the filament will interact with tungsten electrons from the anode. Okay? Is made of tungsten and rhenium. Do you understand that? So I think, of your, you think of your high school track, the grassy area would be molybdenum. The actual track itself would be tungsten and rhenium. Good? Now the stick that also holds the disc to the iron is going to be molybdenum as well. Okay. Any other question? What was your second question? Um, I gotta find it. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Anybody else have questions? We got five more minutes. So the stem, so the stem is molyb molyb molybdenum, and then the. And that runs into the where it says that's also considered the core, which is molybdenum, and then the shaft around that. That's what's made of copper with the iron embedded in it. Yes. Okay. And then a um, couple more questions. Um, sure. so, when you, so when you do okay, so phase so phase one, you energize the anode and you energize the filament and focusing cup. Now phase two is what's so I'm assuming like phase two is you cut off the energy from the focusing cup and the filament. You try to put it up there. Is there a is there a second like electrical charge going to the anode, which then provides the makes that right. make positive? It's a it's a Correct. completely separate one. It's Correct. not the same. It's, a, it's, it's not all separate. Thing. It's not just the two connections. It's all separate because you have a connection to the filament and a separate connection to the focusing cup. Oh. You have a connection to the induction motor to mm -hmm. the stator. And then you also have an induction, I mean, a connection to the anode disc. Okay. So it's almost like you're making the anode disc supercharge. You mm -hmm. have nothing to do with the stator and the rotor. Okay. So that's that. And that's what happens in, in phase two. That Correct. That's electrified in phase two. Okay. Absolutely. And so in your page of 58 and 59, it talks about the... Mechanical, for the phase number one is where you have all of the mechanical, the induction motor, and the filament, the thermionic emission happening. On page, on the second phase, it's actually when you start to initiate the x-rays. And so on this one is where you start to see the voltage then passes through. It gives a little bit more, but I'm not interested in what is a rectifier. It's going to talk about a rectifier, but I'm not, we're not going to do rectifiers right now because then we would have to go back and backtrack the other chapters. It is not essential for what is, for what I need you to know for this chapter. Phase one, phase two. Phase one is where you start to prep. We call it the prep phase. This is where the induction motor starts to spin the anode because we need the anode to be spinning to top speed. We also need the source of electrons. We need to have those electrons already free. So on the second phase, when that happens, we want the X-ray phase. How do we get to the X-ray phase? We need to get those electrons moving to collide. And so what is being applied to that? That's when we're talking about repulsion and attraction or the whole purpose of potential difference, pushing and attracting. Make sense? That's what I need you guys to know. Not rectifiers, auto transformers. That's coming plenty. And then once we get back into the end of the spring, we will tie all of it together. The electrical circuits from the wall all the way to the production of x-rays. And more, because we still have to talk about the body, what x-rays do inside of the body. Any other questions? Please. Have these questions ready for me on Wednesday because this is, this is PRE, okay? Slash physics. Last uh -huh. one. Last sure. one. 
Is the, uh, is the target window and the corner, uh, is that considered the same thing? Yes. Okay. The window, sometimes we'll say the target window or the port, that's where we want the x-rays to um, be emitted. And the one special thing about that specific window is that it's going to be a bit lead line, very thin lead line. And that's just to get those weak x-rays from being emitted out into the patient. So it's going to have some part. But right now, I just need you to know that the target window or the port basically are where the x-rays are exiting out of the tube to become the primary beam. Okay, so it's it's considered a part of the tube and also the housing that I'm right? Is that? Um, no, the actual housing part is just going to be a, I guess you could say that it, the x-ray port, the x-ray tube port or the window sits inside of the housing. So I'm just assuming there's also a port inside of the protective housing that goes to the assembly, collimator assembly, because that's what's happening. The collimator assembly is attached to that opening. I wouldn't necessarily call the protective housing port an item. It's just where the x-rays, the, the, the collimator assembly is attached to. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Guys have been awesome today. I'm loving uh, it. My last uh, question was for the sure. focusing cup. Yeah. Um, that one's made of nickel and a healthy negative charge, right? Yeah. It's a negative charge and it helps hold the, it helps create space charge. And the whole purpose of the space charge is to hold those electrons over until we're ready. Once we've generated enough electrons over, well, we're ready for them to start uh, bombarding. So that's the purpose of the focusing cup. Okay. Oh, Anything else? I just, I just thought of one thing when you when you mentioned the focusing cup. Last one, I promise. You're good. Um, so the focusing cup is made of nickel. Is the reason? Is it just because of the magnetic principle? Is that why they use nickel? Or is there is there any other reason? Um, probably so. I wouldn't know that one to be one hundred. I don't know the answer to to that. Probably so. I know that they choose it because it does have some magnetic properties. And we're, we are discussing electromagnetic energy, but I don't know if that's the sole purpose for it. Okay, I'm just curious. I, I just know that when it's uh, electricity is applied to it, it creates a very much a negative charge, and that's going to aid in that uh, repulsion or that boost of kinetic energy. It's almost like giving it the, the electrons are being pushed out. Anything else? No? All right, well, let me stop sharing. If you guys have any more questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I would like to do it. If you have a couple of more questions, just do it in tutoring, schedule it. It doesn't have to be a full 30 minutes. It just doesn't. The only thing that I ask is if you guys have questions, make sure that you can pose your question. If you're coming to me and say, start from the beginning, I'm going to have to question to see what you do know. Okay? Because I won't be lecturing all over again. So bring your questions and we can figure out where the gaps are. Okay? Bye, guys. See y'all later.